And now we are moving to the last uh, presentation uh, of the panel by Aiko Takuchi Demirji. The title of presentation is Japanese Feminist Pan-Asianisms from Maternalist Pacifism to Moral Rearmament. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Barak. <clears throat> Thank you for the introduction and thank you for all the um, panelists so far for your exciting talk and thank you for the audience for listening. <clears throat> so in this paper, I would like to present Pan-Asian thoughts among Japanese feminists in the context of the internationalist peace movement that emerged during the interwar period. First, I will go to the next slide. Um, First, I will um, introduce a women's organization that played an important role bringing together women leaders in the Asia Pacific region, the Pan Pacific Women's Association. And then I will also look at the views of some feminist leaders in Japan, namely Ichikawa Fusae, who's known for her leading role in the suffrage movement, and also Ishimoto or Kato Shizue, who's a, who was a leading figure of the birth control movement in Japan. These two women had slightly different responses to the war, but they were both Western educated feminists and played important roles in the international pacifist movement during the interwar period which often relied on the idea of motherhood as a common theme that would unite women across the world, especially between the East and the West. During and after War II, um, in order to accommodate the wartime nationalist rhetoric, they started to redirect their attention to creating bonds with women in Asia, while at the same time not alienating the support of Western women or completely abandoning their previous commitment to pacifism. The women's international network started to emerge in the late 19th century, mainly among Western elite women over women related causes such as the women's suffrage represented by the International Council of Women, or temperance, like the Women's Christian Temperance Union, um, or also, especially after World War I, the topic of peace and represented by Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. And by the 1920s, these Western-led women's organizations started to extend their membership to non-Western countries, including in Asia. And, um, and actually, for example, the, um, in 1935, this, the International Alliance of Women, women for suffrage and equal citizenship, the, the 1935 conference, I think was held in Istanbul and they passed a resolution. Um, one of the resolutions that was passed was on East and West in cooperation. And they where they talked about the solidarity of women of the East. But in this um, meeting, the delegates that represented the East was um, were from Turkey, India, Egypt, and Syria, but they didn't um, include like, women in farther eastern um, areas, like in the east, like in East Asia, like in Japan or China. So, but this this idea of bringing together um, women of the east and the west became popularized since the, around the nineteen um, twenties. And they often relied on this concept of what historian uh, Leila Rapp has called feminist Orientalism, that the idea of 
the progressive Western woman helping the West Eastern sisters emerge from backward traditions. And the Japanese feminists who represented these organizations were mostly Western um, or usually American educated and often Christian. But at the same time, the Asian woman who participated, including the Japanese woman who participated in these international organizations were not necessarily puppets of Western women, but they would all often bring their own agenda to the table and define their own relationships with other um, women. So this organization that played a pioneering role in creating um, Women's Alliance in Asia that I want to feature today is the Pan Pacific Women's Association. Um, there were, there was actually another Pan Asian women's meeting around this time, which was the All Asian Women's Conference in 1931. And this group was also remarkable in the sense that it was um, actually, it actually centered around Asian women rather than on um, Western women. But in the end, they were unable to gain significant support from other Asian women outside India. The members that participated were mostly Indian women. And the second meeting that they tried to put together in, in the end never took place. So for the PPWA, this was represented equally by both Western and Eastern women. And it was established after the first Pan Pacific Women's Conference held in Honolulu in 1928. And you can see a photo from the meeting there. This is a photo of the Japanese delegates and you can see quite a few of them attended. Um, I think in total Japanese, the Japanese delegates were 18 people. Um, if you want to see the breakdown, there were delegates from Australia, 16 delegates, um, one from Canada, seven from China, one from Fiji, 91 from Hawaii, and one from India, and from New Zealand, 17, and from the Philippines, two, Samoa, one, and US, 27. Um, so, so this meeting was, followed the initiative of male-centered Pan-Pacific groups that were established a few years earlier, namely the Pan-Pacific Union and the Institute of Pacific Relations. And these Pan Pacific initiatives were formed by Christ, initially formed by Christian based groups like the YMCA in response to the anti Asian, especially anti Japanese movements going on in the United States at the time, which, com, which led to the 1924 Immigration Act that um, prohibited further immigration from Asia. So, unlike other um, Western centered organizations, the PPWA and these other Pan Pacific organizations actually challenged um, racism and imperialism and sought for interracial and interregional cooperation. But they were also in line with the Wilsonian liberal internationalism that characterized international relations during the interwar period in that the elites that represented these groups did not challenge the framework of the nation state or even the colonial um, status quo, but just aimed to find a more, lib more, a more liberal and more peaceful ways to maintain the balance of power. And maternalist pacifism characterized many of the international women's movement during the interwar period, as they argued that no woman would go through the agony of childbirth only to lose a child to war. This was also a universalist, un universalist argument aimed to avoid the division 
uh, um, divisions that often, that were often experienced in other international conferences. The PPWA was presided by Jane Adams, who is who was the um, Nobel laureate in peace. This universalism and pacifism, however, were put to the test and became increasingly difficult to uphold as Japan became further involved in imperial conflicts in Asia, especially after the 1931 Manchurian incident. The international women's meetings typically avoided political and other divisive issues, but some tense moments emerged, especially in during the 1937 Pan Pacific Women's Conference in Vancouver. The Women's Peace Association of Japan organized for this for this meeting, organized a special report on the population problem and asked for it to be included in the agenda as a peace related issue. Now Japan's population problem was often seen as the source of its expansionism and, and imperialist tensions in Asia. But as mothers of Japanese subjects, these Japanese feminists also felt that this was an issue, a peace issue that fundamentally concerned them. Now, birth control was not op openly endorsed at this time, um, especially be um, because of Japan, the government's increasing position, emphasis on pronatalism, but rather overseas migration was seen as the only solution to Japan's overpopulation, which also justified Japan's claim for Manchuria. So the Japanese delegates at the Pan Pacific Women's Conference asserted that this experimental emigration program in Manchuria had shown satisfactory, satisfactory results and pleaded for a spirit of friendliness and fairness, um, especially towards women from Western countries that were blessed with land, land and resources. But then a Chinese delegate turned the tables on the, on the Japanese, arguing that Japan had seized an area that the Chinese themselves needed as a population outlet and market and pleaded for, quote, non-aggression and friendly attitude of foreign powers, especially their immediate neighbors, end quote. However, they stopped short of further bringing the Manchuria um, problem further up for discussion as the Japanese delegates had privately requested beforehand that the delegates not bring up the subject as a political issue during the meeting. So, but similarly, um, when Ishimoto Shizue, the birth control advocate, um, when she attended the International Congress of Women's um, meeting held in Chicago in 1933. During this a panel discussion on security against war, she tried to justify the Japanese military's action by describing Manchuria as our life or, our life or death line and claimed that the only alternative was to, um, quote, commit suicide with her starving population, end quote. An American newspaper reported that Ishimoto seemed to support Japan's action, um, quote, with as much conviction as if she were not a pacifist at all, end quote. Historians, historians have illuminated Jap Japanese feminist compliance with the military government during the war years abandoning their earlier advocacy for maternalist pacifism. In particular, Ichikawa Fusae, the founder of the Women's Suffrage League in Japan, initially decried the Manchuria incident because of women's supposed maternalist pacifism, but then ended up working for the government in many roles. Yet 
Ichikawa's call for universal sisterhood needed just a slight adjustment to make it compatible with the government's rhetoric of Pan-Asianism during the 1940s. Especially in writing with international audience, the meaning Western audience in mind, the Japanese feminist leaders sought ways to reconcile the appeal to universal sisterhood and their support for the Japanese government. The three ideas that were commonly seen in these feminist writings during the war were one, woman's universal suffering during the war, and two, Japanese women's role as leaders of women in Asia, and three, the appeal for support and understanding from Western women. In 1940, Ichikawa and two other um, feminists traveled to Japan occupied Central Asia. And she wrote about her experience and thoughts during this tour in an English language periodical published by the Women's Suffrage League in Japan. And I'm gonna introduce her some of her writings here. As she met some Chinese feminists there, um, who, by the way, supported the pro-Japanese government, um, as well as local Chinese women, she admitted that she encountered some strong antagonism against Japan in many of them, but stressed the need of women in Japan and China to come together for a peaceful future by appealing to this idea of common suffering. As she writes, Everybody has to pay for a war, particularly women pay dearly as wives and mothers. This goes with women on both sides in the current war, Japanese as well as Chinese. Genuine cooperation between women of China and Japan is an absolute prerequisite for the permanent peace of both countries. Ichiko and most feminist leaders in Japan at the time were Western educated. But here we also see a shift in their direction of forming a bond of sisterhood from the West to the East. And in the same essay, Ichika writes, um, we have every reason to regret that educated women of Japan and China, China have so far only concentrated themselves upon absorbing ox Occidental civilization and neglected entirely to know each other, paying little attention to our racial affiliation, which is extremely close, if not identical. To speak only of Japan's case, we must sadly admit that there were very few women in the past who went to China to study and to improve relations between the two countries, while countless women studied in Europe and America. I have, I have been to America twice, but to China, but once, and that very recently. And I feel that the current incident has, has put us in a mood of serious reflection on this point. Furthermore, Ichiko appeals to the Western readers for understanding and support in this effort for Pan-Asian Pan -Asian sisterhood. As she says, I earnestly seek the moral support of the American woman deeply concerned, concerned with the peace of the world to help us as best as you can to make our Sino-Japanese women's cooperation a real success. And in another publication, and this one for the Japanese audience, Ichiko emphasizes how under the um, collaborationist government in Nanking, Chinese women were accorded equal political rights and even po possibly putting their status ahead of Japan. But in the end, she argues that the Japanese women take the lead in this their, in their collaborative efforts to secure education and rights to women and, quote, achieve a hundred years of peace in East Asia, end quote. And next, I also want to introduce the writings um, and views of Ishimoto Shizue, um, one who did not actively support the Japanese government's war efforts. 
Although her ideas were overall in line with other feminist leaders, she avoided political spotlight during the war years because of her reputation as a birth control activist. Ishimoto had actually traveled to Korea and Manchuria when she was younger in 1922, following her husband, the Baron. In her autobiography published in English in 1935, she expressed a rather paternalistic vision of Jap Japanese leadership there to uplift the brothers and sisters in Asia. Her views about Japan's role in Asia became more nuanced though, towards, the, towards the war years, especially once she realized that it could damage the personal relationships with her American friends. She wrote to them how shocked she was um, well, to these American friends, how shocked she was when she saw some photos of the Nanking um, atrocities shown by her American friends, but claimed that most Japanese people had no idea of what was really going on in China. At the same time, she insisted that women in Japan, as well as in China, were suffering alike, even though the situation was probably much worse in China. She tried to appeal to this shared sentiment of suffering a shared sentiment of suffering from war as women and as mothers when she translated um, mainly for the American audience is a story of a common Japanese soldier serving in China called We and Soldiers, Mugi to Heitai, and written by Kino Ashihei. As a mother herself of two sons, who were serving in the war, and one of whom actually died later from tuberculosis, she expected that both the American and Japanese people would sympathize with the human cry of a common soldier and shared a, an indignation against war. But instead, she received harsh criticism from the American leaders, readers for glossing over the evils perpetuated by the Japanese against the Chinese. She was particularly shocked to receive what she called a breakup letter or zekojo in Japanese um, from her dear American friend and woman's historian, Mary Beard, who accused Ishimoto of taking up such a project that essentially glorified Japan's military invasion. Beard seemed to have forgiven Ishimoto eventually, but since then, Ishimoto had taken a much critical stance for J uh, Japan's action in China, but privately and only towards her American friends for the time being. Now, after the war, feminist leaders who had taken active roles supporting the Japanese military government, including Ichikawa Fusae, were purged by the Allied occupation. On the other hand, Ishimoto Shizue, who then remarried and changed her name to Kato, um, because of her pro-American connections, held important roles and became one of the first female diet members elected in the post-war election. Although her role as a politician tackling many women-related policies, including family planning issues, is well known, what is less known yet appear rather prominently in her autobiography is her involvement in this American-led religious-based organization called the Moral Rearmament. And it was through this organization that she expressed the feeling of atonement for Japan's wartime actions in Asia and sought to rebuild a pan-Asian friendship with women in Asia. Moral rearmament was basically a Protestant-based movement launched by American missionary Frank Bushman in 1938, but it's especially known for its strong anti-communist stance after the war 
and attracted leaders of different political and religious affiliations from across the world, including in Asia and Africa, in the name of peace and reconciliation. Um, Post-war post prime ministers in Japan, namely Katayama Tetsu, Hatoyama Ichiro, and Kishinobu Suke, and also um, Nakatsu Nakasone Yasuhiro, um, who later became prime minister, um, they were all actively involved in the MRA during the 1950s. In one of her memoirs, Ishimoto or Kato um, describes this inner awakening that happened to her during an MRA meeting she attended in Michigan. She says that Bushman's appeal to change oneself or a confession of past sins made her realize how arrogant she had been and prompted her to approach the delegates from South Korea. Since then, in every MRA meeting she attended, she would make efforts to talk to members from South Korea, Taiwan, and Southeast Asia who talked of bitter memories inflicted upon them by the Japanese during the war. And Ishimoto would apologize to them for Japan's wartime actions. She also appealed to Prime Minister Kishi himself to work, on, for, work for the normalization of Korean, Japanese Korean relations. And for example, um, um, she writes here that um, the, the attitude of the Korean delegates opened my eyes. I did not, I did my best to apologize and to approach them, but it took quite a while until they finally spoke to me. Since then, every time I went to MRA, I would approach the Koreans. The Japanese public was un unaware of the crime committed by the, their own country, but some of them, once they knew the truth, wanted to apologize. I wanted them to understand that. Really, I wanted to crawl into a hole. They may not forgive me even if I apologize, but I am a diet member, so I shall do my best so that the Japanese people can be in unity with the Koreans. So of course the feminist pan-Asianisms that I presented here had their limits. And not all Japanese femin feminists identified with these ideas. For one, um, usually only elite, usually only elites would um, be able to afford the means to travel internationally at the time and could participate in these international meetings. So, for example, um, Hiratsuka Raicho, who's another iconic feminist leader actually criticized women's internationalism during the interwar period as nothing more than a festive party failing to address the core issues involving Sino-Japanese relations. And after the war, um, Miyamoto Yuriko, who's a renowned proletarian writer, denounced the shallow and hypocritical internationalism and pacifism that was espoused by politicians in the MRA who seemed to have no difficulty traveling internationally while she herself was unable to attend any international meetings, whether it was for world peace, labor unions, or for writers because she could not afford them. She also pointed out, and rather accurately, I believe, of the ideological connections between MRA and wartime fascism, although she did not um, name Kato or, uh, or single out um, women's involvement in it. Regardless of these limits, what I hope to have shown in Japanese feminist active participation in internationalism um, including pan-Asianism during um, the first half of the 20th century is that um, this, that women's international, first of all, women's um, internationalism was made possible mostly through 
international network created and um, led by Western and Christian women. And during and after the war, ironically, because of the government's colonialist Asianist policies, Japanese internationalist women started to direct their attention to forming bonds with women in Asia. Their pan-Asianism was therefore not anti-Western, like it um, often appeared or were expressed in many of the male intellectuals' pan-Asian writings. Rather, these Western-educated Japanese feminists sought the understanding and support of Western feminists for their attempts at creating a bond with other Asian women. And they were not necessarily puppets of Western feminists either, but rather actively tried to imagine a sisterhood and mutual understandings with Asian women on their own terms, even though the feelings might not have been mutual. And these ideas were usually not even articulated as pan-Asianism, but the kind of bond and relationship that they envisioned with other Asian women highlights the possibilities and limits of transnational feminism in Asia in the 20th century. So that'll be all from me and thank you for listening.